they are starting to find out that Islam has the answer and the solution to their problems. But we already know this. We already know this, that we can solve every world problem with Islam. We'll put it into it. But the problem is, we're hiding it from the people. Unfortunately, willingly or unwilling, knowingly, unknowingly, we are hiding this from the people. And there is a statement in the Quran and that, that Allah warns the Jews about what they did with their religion. And it is a statement that is left in the Quran for us. That verily those who conceal the evidences and the clear proofs, after we have made it clear for them in the book, they are those who are cursed by Allah and cursed by those who curse. Until and ex unless they, <clears throat> they repent and reveal that which they have been concealing. Those I will accept their repentance because I am the one who accepts it, the most merciful. We have become guilty just the same way the Jews have of hiding the truth about their religion. When they saw the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, they knew the truth and wanted to hide it. People, we know that we know the truth about Islam and we are hiding it. We as Muslims are running around begging Allah for dignity and honor and help when He has already given it to us in this deen. Everything that a Muslim could ever want has already been given to him in this deen of Islam. Anything that you ask Allah for, there is an account set up for you to go take it out of. You just got to find it where it's at. And any of you, I'm not going to go through the ayahs for there too long, but if you want to know the solutions to every one of your problems in this world and the hereafter, just go read Surah Al-Saf, ayah 10 through 13. Very, very easy solution. If I had the time, I would read them to you, inshaAllah. But we have the cure to every disease in the world. And, and we're not giving it to the people. And I want to use this as a parable because I really want this to hit home with you. Uh, let's say, what is your name, brother? Abdullah. Abdullah, mashallah. Let's say me and Abdullah are, are, are best friends. We're brothers in deen. We're roommates. And we've been roommates for years and years and years. <clears throat> and let's say brother Abdullah has... Uh, contracts an illness, a disease that is one of the most painful diseases that any human being can ever, ever go through in his life and it's not something that is going to kill him quick let's say this disease is going to suffer and fester with Abdullah and make him not be able to eat, sleep, nothing he, he's just miserable all the time when I come home in the, in the evening he's rolling around on the floor in pain and, and let's say I know him in this condition and let's say one day I come across the cure for his disease someone tells me that if you give this to Abdullah or anyone like him, he will be instantly cured and, and he will never suffer again. Um, and let's say I take that and put it in my pocket and I don't give it to Abdullah. Why? Why don't you give it to Abdullah? Well, number one, I'm way too busy. I have two jobs, going to school, you know, I have a long commute back and forth, you know, I got to drive up and down the 405 every day. I don't have time to give Abdullah this medicine, man. If he wants the medicine, he'll go get it himself. I don't have time. I'm really busy. Number two, I'm not a doctor. I, I should not be prescribing Abdullah medicine, and I'm not knowledgeable in medicine. He should, if he wants help, he should go see a doctor. I'm not a doctor. Number three, Abdullah's, uh, please forgive me, but Abdullah's kind of stubborn. He doesn't really listen very well. He probably, he, you know, he's kind of set in his way. So even if I tell him this medicine is good for him and it'll cure him, he probably wouldn't even take it anyway. So why waste my time? Do any of these ex excuses sound familiar? And let's say I don't give this medicine to Abdullah and he dies. And let's say he dies the most painful death that you can ever imagine. I want to ask you a kind of rhetorical question. I want to ask you kind of a rhetorical question. Do you think on the day of judgment that um, Allah is going to call me and Abdullah up and ask him ab about this incident between me, him, and me and him because I've oppressed him. I have oppressed him. I've allowed him to suffer knowing that I could ease his suffering. I'm sure Allah is going to ask us about this. But you know the beauty about Islam is that if Abdullah was a good Muslim, bore this uh, disease patiently and died, he dies as a shaheed, uh, inshaAllah. And on the Day of Judgment, this is how beautiful Islam is, that he could very well come before and Allah ask us about this and Brother Abdullah say, you know what? Allah, I forgive him. So you forgive him. This is the beauty of our religion. And Allah, and Allah will forgive me. But the disease I want to tell you about is the disease that every single non-Muslim walks around with every single day and they don't even know it. It has no, it has no real physical symptoms. And that's the disease of shirk. The disease of being jahl, being ignorant about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah gives them life and they worship someone else. Allah feeds them 
and they thank someone else. He created them and fashioned them in the womb of their mother and knows them better than they know themselves. And they have no idea who he is. They don't even know who he is. If that doesn't pain your heart to see a person in this condition, then, then, then for sure the hearts have become hardened. Because when I see non-Muslims, especially when I sit in places like airports, I see this disease. I see it on them. I see them walking around with it. And there's so many of them passing me, I think to myself, there's no way I could talk to all of them. There's nothing I can do. And this disease is something that not only is not going to show up as a physical symptom, and is going to leave them ignorant about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but when the day they die, they will die the most physically painful death that anyone can ever suffer. The Rasulullah said that when the angel of death comes to the disbeliever, it doesn't come kindly. He yanks the soul through the nose and it's as if he, he, his flesh is torn from his bones. It's as if they take Brother Abdullah and turn him upside down and stuff him in a human paper shredder. This is the death that is waiting for those who do not know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you know the unfortunate thing? That while you've been sitting here listening to me, thousands of people have died. Thousands of people have lost their life not knowing Allah while I'm talking to you right now. People in this city have lost their life and there's nothing we can do about them. They're gone. It's too late for them. We can't save them even if we want to. And that's a deplorable, deplorable, sad, sad fact that we can't save them. But there are many, 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 many who we can save. And that all that takes is us taking this light of Islam we have and showing it to the world. There's a statement in the Bible and I finish with this, whether Jesus uh, said this or not, doesn't matter because this statement is one of the most profound statements that has, has been somewhat of a, a focus for me in my mission of da'wah. Uh, it is said that no one would bring a candle into his home and then place a bucket on top of it because then no one would benefit from the light. No, if someone would bring a candle to their home, they would set it on the table in the middle of the room so that everyone could benefit from this light. And unfortunately, the Muslims of this generation, we are a bunch of candles with buckets on top of it. No one can see our light. No one can see the beauty of Islam in it. Believe me, if you don't see it, believe me, take it from someone who was once standing on the outside looking through the window at that light. It is one of the most beautiful things you can ever lay your eyes on. It is a treasure to be found of treasures. And everyone else can see this and they will see this if we show it to them, if we allow Islam to be Islam, if we start becoming Muslims, meaning that we, the best form of da'wah that you can do to this world is very, very simple. It's not complex. It doesn't take a 10 hour workshop, even though some of the details do. But if you want to know the way, the best way to be, uh, do da'wah is for Muslims to be Muslims. That's it. Study our history. Study the history of Islam. Why was the world conquered by Islam? Not through military campaigns and wars, but through Muslims being Muslims. The most populated Muslim country, Indonesia, was because of Muslims being Muslims. A few Muslims deciding to get up off their behinds and go to another country and live their life as Muslims, not shaving off their deen to be pleasing to those people, but being Muslims. And when the people asked them and inquired, what is it about you backwards Arabs that we've heard all these crazy things about, now you come out of the desert with pristine moral and character and, and you're, you have better ethics and morals than we do. What is it that has happened to you people? And their answer was La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah that we believe in Allah and He has sent us a man named Muhammad and we emulate his lifestyle. That's why we're like this. This is what conquered the world for Islam. This is what conquered people's hearts for Islam was the truth and the beauty of it and its simplicity of its message. This is what brought me and this is what the world needs. With all of this foolishness going on in the world, this is what it needs, the simplicity of Islam, whether they want to hear it or not. They know it in the bottom of their heart when you show them the truth, even if they turn away from it, they know it's the right thing. They know it's the truth. And on the Day of Judgment, you can stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala having washed your hands and saying that I did my job and I finished just one more thing, I finished with this if you don't believe this is important if you don't believe this is one of the most important things you can do as a Muslim um, then the last statement of Prophet Muhammad to the Muslims as a whole, he gave his farewell sermon and we know that his, what his farewell sermon was, was a summary or a synopsis of what Islam is and its general principles and he knew this was the last thing he was going to say to the Muslims as a whole and how did he end this sermon? those who are here Pass this on to those that are not here. 
For verily it may be that the last one that hears my message may understand it and those right here among us. He gave a command to those Muslims to pass it on and for those Muslims to pass it on and for those Muslims to pass it on until there was no one left to hear this message. This was a command he gave, the last command he gave to this ummah as a whole. And then what happened? He pointed his finger to the heavens and said, Oh Allah, bear witness that I have indeed conveyed your message. And upon saying this, what happened? Allah revealed the surah, This day I have perfected for you your deen, and completed my favor for you, and chose for you Islam as your religion. And the last statement that Prophet Muhammad gave to us before this was revealed, was that we must pass this message on. He gave us that duty. He took that duty that was only reserved for prophets. No one else, no other... If you don't believe me, go read Surah al bayna about what was uh, commanded of the other nations. No other nation was given this opportunity and blessing to pass on this deen except us. Because there are no more prophets coming. So the, the job falls on our shoulders. Qurans are not going to fall out of the sky and hit people when they're walking down the street. This job has now become ours. And just like if the Prophet